Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Undoctrinate Yourself. Today, I have an in-person live interview, which is so exciting. You can also see this bucolic background we have, which is real, <laughs> which is valid today, because a lot of time on Zoom, you see those fake backgrounds, but this is 100% natural. Uh, I'm sitting down today with Scott Zimmerman, who's an engineer and an expert in optics and, and basically how light interfaces with things, but we're going to focus on the interactions between light and the human body, which I think is really important and something that we've talked a lot about in this podcast and maybe other avenues. But I think it's really important to get the engineering perspective on this. And I think it will help drive our understanding of ways that we can re-engineer our environments to be more conducive to health. So, but first of all, welcome, Scott. I'm so glad to have you on. Well, thank you. And, and I, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we've been doing. We've been working in this area for Oh, it's been going on almost 10 years now, and uh, it's been hard to get people to understand that uh, we've made a big change. And that's, I keep on saying people don't quite see it, but uh, uh, we're actually going through the largest reduction in solar exposure in human history and the largest increase in light at night. And that is what we're, our work has been mainly focused on trying to A, solve that problem, but B, uh, to understand the real Help, or the real processes, biological processes. And I've been lucky. I mean, I've gotten to team up with a number of different really great researchers. Russ Ritter, that we did a paper four years ago uh, on the optics, melatonin and the optics of the body. And then more recently, I've been working with Glenn Jeffrey and Bob Fosbury. Um, great guys trying to figure to understand what's going on with how light is affecting mitochondria and uh it's a, it's kind of like a I feel like it's almost like everything's starting to coalesce people are is the research is starting to get up to the point that we're starting to understand some of the basics of what's going on and people are also starting to feel the effect of having you know my generation I played outdoors I did you know I built tree houses and uh then I came indoors and got stuck under fluorescence for a while, your generation, a little bit more. And now we're essentially some of the, especially my grandchildren, this is the artificial environment is going to be what defines them in some ways. And, you know, that's where I guess I'm trying to focus uh, all my efforts is to try and understand that and work with certain people around the world and that uh, have similar views, viewpoints, I guess. Yeah, I was actually thinking about that on my drive over here, uh, about how like the Gen Z generation were the ones like the iPad babies, essentially, like they were raised on tech from day one. And I mean, at least in my generation, the millennials, we for the first, like, let's say decade of our lives, we had limited tech. I mean, we had TV still, but I feel like at least I played outside most of the time and was just much more involved in like just nature and not being glued on screens. But starting in middle school, when we got a computer and stuff. That was when things started to shift. And also to your point about how our relationship with light is changing so dramatically, especially with the sun for the first time in the history of our species, it makes me think of how Jack Cruz talks about um, how we're basically creating our own asteroid. Like if you think back to the KT event with the dinosaurs and like there was this, you know, all this debris essentially went up into the atmosphere and completely changed the light environment. Well, we're basically doing that, but we're, we're doing it to ourselves kind of unconsciously. Um, so maybe, I mean, maybe a good place to start would be to talk about a little bit of like specific differences between the ancestral light environment or just natural light environments versus indoor light environments. Well, I think the first thing that people need that it's important to understand is, is that uh, sunlight is not, there's so much work out there where people will run an experiment, use a particular wavelength, a little color of light, and they'll get a result. But that's not what the body is actually adapted to. The body's adapt adapted to exposure from 250 nanometers all the way out to 10 microns and beyond. And in all those cases, the body is almost dealing with thousands of simultaneous, as Bob Lovett likes to say, you know, when he's doing some of his astrophysics stuff, you know, there are thousands of simultaneous equations that have to be solved together to actually explain what's going on in astrophysics. And the same thing's true of the body. You know, yes, I can do an experiment and I can expose uh, the body to a certain kind of wavelength or a certain area of wavelength, and it causes a biomarker to change. Glucose level drops or um, the CO2 uh, levels increase like, lens shown so well but the reality is is that the body's doing that and doing uv 
vitamin D and doing all these other stuff, generating hydrogen peroxide, generating ROS, all that stuff is going on. So, so much of what we have right now in our research papers are essentially just looking at little snippets mm -hmm. of what's going on, what the body is expecting to see. And I think that's where I, 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 my, my background, I, I don't like to go too far into the biology because that's not really what I'm, I've been teamed up with people that know the biology. What I do is the optics. And what the basic premise is, is that when you see the body do certain things optically, it's doing it for a reason. You know, and when you start looking at how the body is localizing certain portions of the solar spectrum in certain tissues by some really amazing optical processes, you know, your eye, how it works, but it's not just that, it's your brain, how certain wavelengths penetrate into through the skull and into the cerebral spinal fluid and go down into the, um, the um, gray matter. And it just happens to the gray matters, right, where that can work out the best. And so over and over again, you find all these different optical mechanisms that uh, we hadn't taken into account in what we're doing. And especially now with the DOE coming in and putting so much of a clamp down on, on lighting, what people may not know, but the new rule change for that the DOE is imposing on everybody essentially makes it impossible to do anything but visible light. Mm-hmm. And that represents such a small part of the solar spectrum. And in a lot of ways, it's almost, I, I keep on saying, it's time for us to move past circadian. There's more to a light to what's going on than just circadian. The body is using stuff that has no eye response in the near infrared, in the UV, out into the near infrared, and even out into the shortwave infrared. So first and foremost, I guess the, the, the point is, is that when we walk outside, it's like, I keep on saying there's a lot of people that that get upset about blue. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, the blue. But when you look up at the sky, like today, it's blue. But it's not just blue. The majority of the radiation coming into your body from reflecting off the trees, from the sky itself, even the dirt is essentially acting like the sense of uh, some nature sunglasses it's actually increasing the amount of near infrared and shortwave infrared that we are exposed to while we're being exposed to blue so that's entirely different than what we get when we're sitting here looking at a laptop or our tv only thing you're getting is blue yeah and what we're finding more and more is is that the near infrared the shortwave infrared even into the mid infrared uh, is providing a basis for us being able to look at blue wavelengths safely. Because from a photochemistry standpoint, any of the wavelengths that are shorter than about 480 nanometers are capable of randomly breaking a bond. So the, the body, what did the body do? The body developed this outer skin that essentially is a sacrificial layer. It sloughs off every 20 days. And that's because it can't it, it's stuck with the fact that there's this high energy com photons coming in that they're having to deal with. Um, and then what we're showing is, is that the near infrared and the longer wavelengths are then, they penetrate deeper into the body. They kick up the mitochondrial response and provide some kind of a protective or reparative type uh, uh, response to the body that allows us to walk out and enjoy a beautiful blue sky. So... Yeah. And I mean, just for people's edification, if they've listened to the podcast before, they'll probably know this already, but just in case you haven't, midday sun is like over 50% red and infrared light, about 25% blue light, maybe less than 10% UV light. Um, but the point being that if you're outside during the day, you're always receiving an abundance of red and infrared, like this long wavelength light. And that can be dappled in with the shorter wavelengths like the blue and UV. But basically what I think the main point is that you're always supposed to be bathed in this long wavelength light and i think that's not even not a mistake either because if it was an evolutionary constant or an ancestral constant then our bio biology clearly adapted to be able to thrive in that environment in particular and if you're sitting behind glass so about how much of like the near infrared wavelengths does glass scatter glass is a great transmitter the problem is is that it's not glass that we put up anymore yeah what we do is we put a coating on the, the glass that reflects all the near infrared from coming into the building. 
Now, like I say, we're sitting out here. If you could see in the near infrared, all the tree leaves, the ground, everything would appear to be bright white, like it was covered in snow. So what you see is, is that when we're outdoors, uh, optically, you know, the visible, we, we can see what we do in the visible range. But the reality is, is that there's tons of, of reflected near infrared, which actually shifts the ratio. And one of the things I've done a lot of work with is looking at ratios of different portions of sunlight. And yes, it is true. If you're standing there and you're laying on a beach frying yourself and direct sunlight, it's about equal amounts of near infrared to visible in optical watts. But the minute you get anything like even dirt or trees around you, it immediately, they have reflectivity close to 90%. So what ends up, it's kind of like we're walking through this little integrating sphere, you know, white walls all around us, but we don't even know it's there. But what it ends up doing is providing, you know, you can get up to 30 megajoules per day off of sunlight if you're just exposed to it. But what it does is it shifts the entire, by being outdoors under a tree in the shade, it drops the intensity levels, but it also shifts the ratios. So you get a lot more near infrared relative to blues, greens, and UV because of the shading effects of the tree. The trees, the plants were here first. Mm -hmm. They walked in and they said, we're going to survive. We can't run around, but we're going to survive. And what they do is that they grab red and blue and they use it for generating photosynthesis for keeping themselves alive. So you think about as we're walking into this environment, this environment is already sitting there saying, hey, there's tons in the infrared. And so what appears to be happening is, is that the, the, our body is optically designed to localize the near infrared in certain critical tissues, be it your retina. And it's surprising. <laughs> the eye actually is, is an amazing optic and for imaging to see a view, but it's even more amazing when you look into it from a non-imaging aspect. In other words, literally what happens is, is that most of the photons that, that hit the retina don't go through the pupil. They actually go through your sclera and through the other, because it's a much larger area collection. And we call it a non-imaging optic uh dielectrically filled and what that guarantees is that there's almost a 10 to 1 ratio of near infrared to visible in the eye same thing happens in your brain through the cerebral spinal fluid similar thing happens in the womb when a woman is pregnant the amniotic fluid actually acts like a kind of like a dielectric filled integrating sphere guaranteeing that the that she feel her skin filters out all the shorter wavelengths, and then when as as uh, which, but the near infrared can actually penetrate too and bounce around, uniformly bathing the fetus in uh, near infrared. And then as the pregnancy progresses, which I think is the coolest thing optically, the woman's skin starts to stretch, and as it stretches, it increases the wavelengths that are allowed to go to the fetus. It also then helps that fetus. Not only does it tend to suppress certain cytokines that have been linked to autism, but it also defines how the eye develops because the eye is developing in the womb, but it's changing as, as now that was the case in old times. Now we don't do the same thing. And not that I would ever say that a woman made a mistake not being out, but we're just trying to understand this is what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my concern is, is that, you know, we need that the fetus and the mother both need to be exposed to the entire solar spectrum, not just some little slice of it. And if they are, then it, start, it creates imbalances in certain hormones and things of that nature. When I did the paper with Russ on melatonin, that was Russ's thing. I mean, Russ has 40 years discussing melatonin. He's got 100,000 citations. And I walked in, here's the little optical engineer going, walking into the guy who knows everything about melatonin. And his comment was, is he said, Scott, you got to get this published out there because nobody in the biology, biological world are thinking about the optics. Mm -hmm. And that's what I guess at the end of the day, that's what I've been focused on. And the more I dig, the deeper I look at it, we're finding all these periodic structures that and for people who don't are, don't know, if if you have a refractive index, it's it's how telecom works, it's how the internet works, all this other stuff. The you set up these gratings, 
these period of different indexes and you can change where light goes and plants do it to generate chlorophyll or to uh, do photosynthesis but in the chloroplast but uh worse what's becoming clear is is that there are structures within the body that are doing the same thing so as we progress first we start out with just basic geometric optics then we talk about wave optics and now we're talking about photonic band gaps and things of that nature with anything it's just i think that you're going to see that there's going to be this progression that we understand deeper and deeper what's going on with the optics you're going to have a new understanding of what the body's really doing and uh, yeah so sorry <laughs> no that's it was a, it's a beautiful um explanation it's making me think of a lot of things but i mean one thing that's coming to mind is that uh from like sun up to sundown, does the total amount of near infrared light is it consistent or does it change throughout the day? Uh, it changes, okay. and the, like I say, the peak or the minimum ratio is at, at direct sunlight high noon. As you go to longer wavelengths, you'll see that uh, are to different parts of the day and night. Yeah, you'll see a shift to where the near infrared levels come up. So is that a fractional increase or is it a total? Well, I, I like I say, I talk about uh, the ratio of, of yeah. uh, near infrared to visible, right, or right. visible to near infrared, and at, it's one to one at noon. It goes to about three or four to one when you get towards sunset or Got in the it. early morning. Now, again, um, I I feel sorry for blue. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big a feeling sorry for blue right now, <laughs> but um, because. It, one of the things is, is that everybody's is trying to blame blue for being the problem when in reality it's not blue itself it's the fact that blue that we see is so much more it's yeah. got the near infrared it's got the short wave and you know you can say oh well beautiful sunset beautiful oranges beautiful reds all you have to do is look to the side and you'll see blue sky you know so it's and the body one what we what is very clear is is we need to start uh, thinking about the body in terms of being a solar collector. Mm -hmm. When we are we are walking upright, we are blocking the direct light most of the time by our hair or the trees that we're in or whatever. But there is this huge solid angle of acceptance all around us. We are like this kind of little pillar sitting right there, collecting things from all different directions in all different wavelengths. And that's where I think this whole argument about penetration depth and all that gets off in the weeds. Yes. What really matters is what's the total incidence that you're accepting. And one of the things that's just so cool is that Bob Fosbury's done some pictures where he's shown how you can shine light through six layers of clothing in there of red and it lights up fine. You can put your hand down on top of a, of a source and look at it. You see all the way through it, the entire thing. And I keep on saying, just go into your, your bathroom or whatever, dark room, put your thumb over your cell phone and look at how it lights up. Now, according to all the optical models, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. you, over and over again, you'll see, oh, the penetration depth is only one millimeter at 850 nanometers. No, that's wrong. And here's a picture of it. If, you know, if you can't believe a picture, I don't know what you're supposed to do. But uh, but it, it unfortunately has gotten in the way because there's been so much attempts to do treatments and things of that nature versus really just trying to understand the optics. And once you get into something like what happens is, is that in the body, the um, absorption coefficients are dropping, but also the scatter coefficients are dropping. And so what you, you, I keep on saying, it's kind of like, you know, how you, you get a, build a snow fort and you get kind of thin layer up there and you can see the sun. It kind of just spreads out all over everything. That's what the body's doing. And it's doing that because that allows it to distribute, you know, think about it from the standpoint of what's the goal. There are trillions of mitochondria in your body. And the more you can in, stimulate them, with sunlight, the more effect you're going to have. And so it's like kind of doing, everybody's still stuck on the 2D argument, ignoring the fact that this is a three-dimensional problem. And you got all these, once I start expanding this out three-dimensionally, you know, then you start to see why, how 
you know, huge amounts of mitochondria can be being affected, generating melatonin, generating, you know, reactive oxygen species, or, you know, dealing with reactive oxygen species in the cell. And, you know, there's all this stuff is going on optically because of the way, and like I say, you look at Bob's picture of the hand and it just, it's just right there. You can't ignore it. And what's really important, I think, is to understand that optically, children are the most affected because they're smaller. Mm -hmm. So if I have, if I'm getting light distributing in inches into the body, almost hundred percent of their cells are being affected right at the time when you're dealing with hormone changes and all this other stuff. And that's my biggest concern with what's going on is, is that, you know, the children are going to be affected. And unfortunately, you know, every season, you know, turn a TV on and kids are locked in. Totally. Know? And uh, they're being exposed to visible only, which in by definition, and it's not my work, it's other work by Ray and others, you know, the minute you take a visible source and you start exposing somebody to it, their cortisol levels start to go up. And, you know, how far depends on how long you do it, how bright the TV is. And what's happening is, is what gets me is, is that, you know, it used to be when we were doing, we had a little screen like this or a little, you know, now we got huge, huge yeah. and they're putting out tons and tons of light in, you know, in a lot of places, you know, the TV is a bigger light source, especially towards the evening than anything, even the lighting. And so, so, you know, that's, that's uh, the gist of what I think what's really important to start working on here is to understand how the body's using these other wavelengths and trying to use that to essentially make a, a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about like all of the red light devices on the market now and how you're basically get maybe four wavelengths of light in there. But if you look at the solar spectrum, it's kind of this continuous. So like, let's say you're interested in, I don't know, 670 nanometer red light, but then you're also getting, you know, 671, 672, you're getting a continuous spectrum and each wavelength is going to be like providing a considerable dose as well. So it's because I feel like a lot of the red light companies will market it as like, oh, this, you know, the dose of 670 is equal to that you receive in the sun. But you're not thinking about all the other wavelengths in between that. So the cumulative dose of like all red and in near infrared light is completely, you know, much higher in the sun versus any of these devices. Is that correct? That's correct. And, you know, while they may be able to do a very localized peak intensity level that's higher than the sun, the reality is, is, as I said from the very beginning, the sunlight is a continuum. Yes. And it is the body, every time you turn around, you may fix this or you may change this biomarker, but you may also have degraded this biomarker that you're not looking at, number one. Number two, so much of the red light therapy, um, and I, if it works for people, great. I mean, I'm not arguing about that. Um, but so much of the red light therapy doesn't control what happens to their test subject. They do a 20 minute exposure. Did the person then go outside? Did the person then go into a fluorescent lit room? Did the person go take a nap? You know, and, you know, so one of the things that I thought was the, the, was the coolest thing was when I found the papers by Theron and, and the work by Gao, where they're now, what's happening is, is all these biosensors and ability to do measurements uh, at higher fr sampling frequencies, because bear in mind, most of the circadian work, you know, they do something and then four hours later or the day, 12 hours later, they'd measure it. And that's fine. But when you start looking at and sampling at a high rate, which is only about four papers in the world that actually do this right now, and we're trying to work with some biosensors to heck, make it uh, so that we can do more. But literally when you start to do an exercise, Within 10 minutes, there's a huge spike in not only cortisol, but a huge spike in melatonin. And if you believe Gao's work, where he was measuring sweat, characteristics of cortisol, what literally happens is, is that when you do a stressor, be it exercise, going outside, all this other stuff, the body responds. It has to respond. But that response, is, I keep on saying, it's kind of like having a tennis ball in your hand. Take a picture, throw it up, catch the tennis ball, take another picture. You know, if you can't sample fast enough, you aren't going to be able to see what's actually going on in real time. And these transient events are huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you believe Theron's data, he literally put a person on a treadmill 
or on a stair stepper for four hours. And within 10 minutes, it had gone up to, you know, well above what uh, normal, I forget the exact number of what, what level, uh, the melatonin went up to 200 picograms per milliliter, which is higher than what you'd normally expect in a circadian response. Mm -hmm. But he did that at nine o'clock in the morning. And he was at the minute he stopped doing that exercise, they stopped doing that exercise, within a half hour, it was back down to baseline. So there are all these transient effects that I, in I, my, wor my world, I think of it as being that depending on what I did during the day, I either have an advantage of cortisol or an advantage of melatonin. And yeah, I can go and put up, I used to put up hay out in, in Kansas. And, you know, after spending all day putting up hay, I didn't have a lot of trouble sleeping, you know, but if you don't get that and you don't get that interplay, because what was really cool was, is what Gao showed was, is that as you get up into, uh, into the exercise within about 10, 20 minutes of that initial spike up, you start to see it dropping down. And there's some very interesting papers that claim that uh, melatonin has the effect of suppressing ACTH mm -hmm. and suppresses cortisol. Right. So, uh, you think about cortisol is very important, but you don't want it out of control. So it appears based on this res transient response we're seeing from Theron and from Gao is, is that the purpose of melatonin going up during the exercise is to actually suppress cortisol and bring it back in and keep you within a range. And that's what I think is so interesting about the whole process of these hormones is, is that Everything we're doing in our envir artificial environment now, uh, be, it, be it the space station, be it whatever, is pumping cortisol. It's like we're all becoming cortisol addicts or wiping out our adrenal glands or whatever. And that's my big concern about, you know, optically, you know, our, from the, the measurements we've done or had people have done and shown, we've shown is, is that uh, it's very important that the entire solar spectrum is involved, number one. Number two, that we get uh, don't get a constant bump up in cortisol because it takes, there was a paper that, where they have brought in a bunch of cocaine addicts and the cocaine addicts um, were given a shot or hit and they measured all their different hormone levels. And what cortisol took almost three hours to get back down after it got shot up. Wow. And I think that's, one of the things that uh, we need to be concerned about it, yeah, I, you know, especially some of these uh, virtual reality things and all that. If you're con, I mean, what's the point of TV? TV is to excite you, to get you jumped up. I mean, if you go to a, to a casino, what do they do? They flash lights, they make mm -hmm. noises, they keep you, you a lot of alcohol, you know, that's what they're getting a response, but to have, that's one thing to do a response for a little bit. It's another thing day in, day out, exposed. And that's what was what we've kind of focused in on our light sources is to try and mimic as much as we can the entire spectrum and thereby hopefully give at least a response to to uh, all this constant, you know, overexcitation is what I call it, or overstimulation. Totally, totally. And with regards to the melatonin story, I think it's really interesting. Do you know if that researcher has understood whether the melatonin increase in the circulation is from the pineal gland or it's being released from cells like via like the mitochondrial melatonin pools? Well, if you believe Theron's data, which I do, I um, mean, what he did is he, he was continually sampling the melatonin levels during the exercise. And again, it's during the stressor that he's doing it. Now, it was nine o'clock in the morning when he was doing this until one o'clock in the afternoon. He went up within 10, 10 minutes and held constant. So now there's a really great interface or quick interface between uh, the muscle cells and plasma, you know, your blood supply. And it appears, you know, that when you're under the, the muscle cells are generating lots of reactive oxygen species, they are also generating a lot of melatonin. Mm -hmm. And I think it's almost pretty definitive that the pineal gland, while it's again, circadian, fine, it, I don't disagree with it. It's on a different time scale, but the majority of melatonin appears to be produced in the mitochondria oh, outside yeah. of the pineal gland is what that data says, says to me. Mm -hmm. 
The only other alternative I can think is it's getting out of the gut maybe, but that wouldn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense if you have localized muscles, you're giving everything. You know, that's the other thing that that I, I come back to is, is that if you just look at it from a control standpoint, you know, there are so many things that the body has to respond to locally that can never be done with a systemic response, you know? Yeah, I'm sitting over here, and Gal did a really great sh thing that showed that. What he did is he took a sweat sensor, cortisol sweat sensor, and put it on his left arm, stuck the other one in an ice bath. You like ice bath? I love them. <laughs> stuck it in an ice bath. In six minutes, it actually translated cortisol level in this arm actually went up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a local response and a systemic response. By the time I, the body got around to figuring out that I just cut off my arm, I, you know, it might be that there's something's trying to help me or you got a big cut over here or whatever. Something is doing something locally. So I think you need to, again, there's got to be a local response and a systemic response and the time constants are different for those two things. Mm -hmm. And, and the body has to be able to respond quickly enough to actually stop something that's serious. Yeah. I mean, for the listeners, just briefly, so melatonin is this really powerful antioxidant that's basically present in all, I mean, at this point, we think it's all mitochondria within um, the body and initially was, you know, back in bacteria and like primordial times. It's this very conserved molecule that's highly efficient at scavenging free radicals, essentially. And it was thought, I think up until recently, that that mitochondrial pool of melatonin was like you know, a completely separate thing from the pineal melatonin, which is released into the circulation, helps you get sleepy and fall asleep. But it sounds like maybe muscle or other tissues become more permeable and can allow that melatonin out during exercise, for example, or some other stressor. Yeah, I think that the, what the data seems to indicate is, is that at some point, the reactive, you know, the body has to overreact to reactive oxygen species, whether it likes it or not. But, you know, as if you're doing intense exercise, and you can see in the sweat or in the blood, either one, that there is a huge boost in melatonin and cortisol together. And I believe very strongly based on the data I've seen that, that what's happening is the melatonin is there not only to deal with all the reactive oxygen species, and melatonin is the best antioxidant. I mean, it's not just melatonin, it's all its metabolites as you go down have different antioxidant characteristics. So you get like 10 to one, you know, one molecule of melatonin does 10 times that amount. And so it's a very powerful antioxidant, but it also has all these other things where it can control how much ACTH is you know, being generated, which then controls how much cortisol is being generated. And, you know, whether you call it yin yang or whether you call it negative feedback loops, bottom line is to control something as complex as the body there has to be some counter to almost every hormone, protein, or whatever. It has to be something that counters it to keep it in balance, or we'll just go off the rails, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, I, I think it's very clear that the pineal gland truly has a function. It's it's trying to, it's, it's almost like a wish list, in my opinion, from the standpoint, it's trying to drive you to take maximum advantage of sleep and being awake. But during the day, especially, you know, when you're doing something, you can get all kinds of transient responses that are bigger than what you get from a circadian. It's what the data shows. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's also really interesting that there are these parallel dynamics among uh, cortisol and melatonin in the context of exercise or other stressors and in the context of circadian biology as well, because we see like melatonin and cortisol as these circadian biosensors as well that respond to light where melatonin in darkness is ramped up. And in response to light in the morning, you're getting that cortisol spike that's like naturally happening when you wake up and you get like that first morning light. So I think it's really interesting that they're both, they do seem to kind of regulate each other in some way, because if you look at like the nadir and the, like the peak in the trough, essentially for each, they kind of mirror each other. So I think it's a, uh, I think it's a really interesting observation. But also speaking of biomarkers, um, hopefully I'm going to... Well, can I just put in one quick oh, thing? Oh, please. I'm sorry. But one of the things that really struck me the most when I was looking at these ratios, and so what I do is I do near-infrared, near-infrared to visible, or visible to near-infrared, and then I do melatonin to, to cortisol ratios. But there's this really great paper that uh, was out there 
where he, they took people who were suffering from schizophrenia and clinical depression. And at midnight, they measured their melatonin and cortisol levels against the control people that they had there. And it wasn't a large study, but it was significant. They had the p-values of 0 0.001 or something like that. But um, bottom line is, is that there was a 5x lower melatonin to cortisol ratio in the people that had schizophrenia and clinical depression than the controls. Wow. And so I think that what people maybe need to think about is there's always, we'll measure melatonin, we'll measure the cortisol. I think it's the, the ratio that they really need to be measuring. And, you know, if you look at it from that standpoint, you think about, wow, if that's really a true indicator, if we're forcing us to have higher, you know, it's two two sides. You know, I can either have less melatonin I'm generating because as we get older, we generate less melatonin. It, or I can have more cortisol. As we get older, our cortisol levels go up. So it's the ratio, I think, that is really important. And if it has the effect on the neuro, you know, our neurological health that I think it does, you know, it could explain a lot of the stuff that we're fighting now. So... That's my thing. That's, Sorry about that. No, please. That's I, that's very interesting. And I, I think we can learn a lot from ratios in general. I don't think it's necessarily helpful to always look at things in isolation. When you look at things relative to other things that are also in flux and movement, I think it can be really insightful. And actually, that reminds me, I wanted to ask you, does near-infrared light stimulate the production of melatonin in mitochondria? We believe it does. That There seems to be... The problem is I'm trying to get them to actually make the measurement carefully. It's hard. Yeah, it is. Because, I mean, if you look at Zoo's data, she measured melatonin and cortisol, but she didn't keep track of whether or not they were during the day or at night or what time. But you see all these huge amounts of melatonin being generated and women, you know, young men were better at it than older men. Women, older women and young women were about the same as far as the, the data was showing. But what I'm really hoping to do is get us to the point that we actually measure during solar exposure and exercise, you know, to see whether or not we can see it. Because it, the bottom line is, is that it's really hard with melatonin because if it is doing what it's supposed to do, an antioxidant, it's going away, you know? Yep. So versus cortisol, it doesn't degrade, you know, it's not doing anything. It's, it's being, it's doing its whatever thing, but it has only real one function, which is to excite us and get us to these pro it's an important function. Don't get me wrong, but melatonin is not only generating that function, but are dealing with the, the cortisol. It's also dealing with all the reactive oxygen species. And so it's being consumed at a rate that makes it hard to actually measure. And mm -hmm. so, but the sweat data shows melatonin being generated during exercise outdoors because there was a couple of bikers. They obviously were out doing something. But if I could just get us to run the experiment in a certain, you know, with the right controls in it, with the right methodology, I think then we could answer that question. You Would know? you want like muscle biopsies? No, I mean, I think that, I think the first step is just to do a controlled experiment where you do it under illumination, non-illumination, and measure. That's why it's so interesting with the sweat. There's a couple of new companies that are starting to develop cortisol melatonin sweat monitors. Cool. Yeah, and we're trying to get them to do to do some work in that area because clearly you can see they they in their advertisement they show during during exercise cortisol goes up. Melatonin is kind of doing something, but we're not real sure. And so that's my own goal would be to figure that out. Irregardless, I mean, there's melatonin's doing a lot of stuff in the body and you can't have it jump up to the levels it jumped up during exercise without it coming from the mitochondria in the muscle cells is what I believe. Whether or not the skin cells are doing all that, I don't know but for sure, but it appears that they are, so... It's really interesting. I mean, my goal is to start a lab at some point in the next couple of years. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely thinking now maybe we should probably collaborate at some point. At well, one, and if I, I think, <laughs> you know, the, the it is so exciting to see all these biosensors that are got sampling frequencies fast enough where we can see the transient effects. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it does you no good. I'm not done saying that. It's there's so much that can go on in the four to eight hours afterwards that 
had nothing to do with the the transient response. Yep. And you know that's what I'm. Uh, I really am quite uh, optimistic that we're going to be able to start nailing down what is the actual key, you know, responses because. I mean, they're huge. They're absolutely huge numbers that, uh, I mean, in some cases, the zoos data, the melatonin and the cortisol levels were higher than the blood plasma levels. Where'd that come from? You know? So in the sweat, you're saying? In the sweat. Oh, yeah. That, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, to do something in a lab where the, you know, with these new biosensors and to do it in a controlled manner and understand, you know, during exercise, during the events, We'll be able to start telling people this is good for you because this and yep. all that. And I think that's what uh, what we're really lacking. I agree. I mean, something that I recommend for clients and for myself is whenever I'm moving, if I can do it outside versus indoors under artificial light, I feel like I feel better. I feel like I feel less sore. Uh, I just feel like I have better energy during the workout. So I, it feels like a no brainer, but it'd be really good to have data also saying like, this is going to be beneficial for these reasons. It's going to increase, you know, whatever going to improve your sleep quality it's going to improve your recovery or whatever else like based on these biomarkers and other things um i think we just need some research to support it yeah and, and it needs to be you know roger seaholt's been pushing for you know clinical trials with the controlled tests and it, it just needs to happen because we've got the technology to do it and you know i think it'll be interesting to see because uh, what happened is is in the international space station they actually started looking at the blood characteristics of the astronauts after 6 months to a year and what they saw was saw was clear mitochondrial deg degradation now is it all, they happened to have one of the most sophisticated circadian led lighting systems in the world and they were under it 100% for 6 months to a year now is it the only thing that was going on up there no but they're now seeing that submariners are having issues. They're having, when they built all these great uh, stealth boats, they took all the portholes out. Now they're having people go out 60 days and they're not feeling too great when they come back. Mm -hmm. You have people that are stuck at night shift. You have people that are, uh, you know, they're showing all these linkages to um, street lights at night for women's breast cancer, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is, is, is the whole point of this is to try and understand. And I believe the optics are a great way to do that because you, once you start understanding the optics, you see selections that the body has made, choices it's made in this huge in simultaneous equation thing. It said, this is good for me. This is bad for me. And I'm going to put more of this over here and more of this over there. And, you know, it's it's interesting because uh, I'll give you another one just for the fun of it because I think it's kind of cool. There was work by Yakimo where he um, showed that the outer 50 microns of your skin is photochemically bleached. The melanin is. And it's that 50 microns is about how far the 285 nanometer UVB penetrates in. Now, what's the point of UVB? It's supposed to oxidize cholesterol. Really hard to oxidize cholesterol. So you only get about 8% efficiency according to some studies. So what happens? Well, the one thing that can bleach, it's really hard to bleach out the melanin in most people, or in, 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 just hard to photo bleach it out. But it's real easy to photochemically bleach it out. In order to do that, you need hydrogen peroxide. Well, there's all kinds of, there was work done by Laura, Hudson and all that, where she exposed to the, much of the full spectrum of sun as she could, skin cells. What happened? Hydrogen peroxide levels went up by 6x in exactly the same 50 microns because it was being done by the short wave, which is absorbed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it, to me, it's just, is a coincidence? I don't think so. I think like the body, body's doing stuff to try and um, optimize survival. And I don't know if it's true. I'm trying to actually figure it out. But uh, it appears that that outer 50 microns is, if you actually look at it, causing a slight, very similar to the effect of a blue jay's wing, where it actually is reflecting some of the blue people, some people who have really dark skin, 
have kind of like a blue shimmer yeah. to them. Yeah. Well, it, what it appears is, is this outer 50 microns is kind of like a, a, a photonic band. It's, it's like a Bragg mirror in some ways that allows to reflect certain things like a blue jay. A blue jay has essentially melanin and structure to generate reflects preferentially reflect blue, but you can only see it when it's against a black background. Mm -hmm. So when people have very dark skin, have the possibility, you know, what these people appear to mention that, hey, it looks like there's almost a blue. It may be optically real. And that would cool. be really cool. <laughs> wow. Because what it would say is, is that, you know, that outer 50 to optimize itself and get the maximum performance, the body has used not only the UVB, but it's using the longer wavelengths. And we're talking about two to three microns way out there. But it turns out optically that because of the strong absorption of water, when you, if you took a picture of you or me, doesn't matter who you want to take it. We all have super dark skin in this mid range, short wave infrared and mid range infrared because water absorbs almost instantly what's going on. So the highest photon density is not in the UV or the visible. It's actually out here in this little bitty bump that everybody says, well, there's nothing going on there. It turns out that's the highest photo density of in, in that area. And it's all localized in the water mm -hmm. that's in that outer part. And, you know, Professor Zare out at Stanford and some others have been showing that it's a whole lot easier than what we thought it was to change water into hydrogen peroxide. And so, you know, if you don't get it, then it still works. It still tries to do it, but you don't get quite the amount of vitamin D. Now we have a global lack of vitamin D production. Okay. All I'm saying is the body's been doing this and the places where you don't have <laughs> the vitamin D is people who are out in the sun more, you know, and is it integrated or, you know, is it uh, all related? I think it is, or that's what we're trying to think. But again, it's an optical effect and uh, which I think is really cool. So it is really cool. And it's reminding me of my last conversation with Jack Cruz. We talked about how water is the primary red light chromophore and, and infrared light chromophore oh. in the body and how crucial that is. And that also harkens back to Pollock's work and like the charge separation of water to form exclusion zones can be facilitated. Also, I think the maximum uh, efficiency was at like three thirty one hundred um, nanometer light was really, really good at facilitating that. Well, and if you look at the the first work I was doing was out from Wunsch and from Zastro. They did uh, electron spin resonance measurements of skin. And I was just using the data and they had the data there and I was plugged it all in and I was working on it. And I said, hey, I wonder if you flipped it. Well, the minute I flipped it and looked at how many photons it took to actually generate a reactive oxygen species, just as an average, if all of a sudden every one of the theoretical water overtones showed up in the data. Whoa. And there are like seven of them. And, you know, I, I look at Wikipedia and I say, holy cow, dunk, 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 dunk. they're all there. <laughs> so it appears that as much as we'd like to think we understand water, you know, at certain absorption overtones, and there's a lot of them in water, that you get this um, enhanced generation of ROS. Now that's, reactive oxygen species, that's not hydrogen peroxide because you can't measure hydrogen peroxide with your electron spin resonance. But you tuple that with Hudson work and all that, you start to see that that uh, we're maybe not as quite as smart as we thought we were when it came to water. And I think that Jack is probably right that uh, water is the primary chromophore, uh, chromophore. But what really matters, in my opinion, is, is that optically, you know, different portions of the spectrum are affected in different ways. And even though it, like I say, if you have somebody plot out the solar spectrum in Watts for whatever, um, you'll see this big pike in the visible and you'll see all these water bonds and all this other stuff. And then you'll see this little bunch down here that goes from, you know, 1100 or from 2000 uh, out to 4,000 and oh, there's nothing going on there. That's where all the, the energy, uh, not the energy, but the density of photons is highest in the human body. And that's why we look black at, and, and we'll have white hair. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you'd look really great if we could take a picture. <laughs> and why? And the, yeah. And the same with your shirt. It turned white mm-hmm. because there's not water in it like there is in your body. I mean, you have to accept the fact that we're kind of walking around like this bowl of water. Some of us are bigger bowl than others. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's essentially, uh, you know, we're carrying around our water supply. Meat and, balloon. Yeah. Full of water. Full, full of water. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on non BMFs? And how they're interfacing with our biology? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a can of worms. <laughs> it is. It is. We, we also need better research. We do. Yeah. We do. And, and it's unfortunate, you know, I, you know, I think that the people need to accept that discovery is messy. Mm-hmm. And this whole garbage associated with disinformation Anybody who sits there and tells you they understand what's going on biologically in the body is a liar. And the fact that you would take and attack, I I use Pollock for example, because I think he was crucified over easy water and terrible choice in names, just saying, but he's a brilliant man. And he is there. Now we're recoaxing it into bound water, you know, interfacial, forces or whatever you want to call it but you know it was unfortunate because we lose time when we have these stupid conversations where it's more about trying to i i said this on a chalkboard someplace at one point in time and you know now i i you know you can't prove me wrong or my ego gets in the way Mm -hmm. and you know we're struggling with the with it from our standpoint of you know, the DOE is sitting there putting in this 120 lumen per watt rule mm-hmm. in four years. It essentially negates me being able to provide what I think is a healthy lighting. I think that they are dead wrong. In fact, I think that when it comes down to it, though that green initiative, and I'm not, I'm for green on a lot of levels, but there has to be a responsibility associated with it. And it was irresponsible what the DOE is doing. They're trying to save a little bit of energy but they're squashing. We are the only, only GSL lamp manufacturer. That's not saying much, but we are the only U.S. manufacturer of GSLs in the country. What's a GSL? Uh, general service lamp. The little screw in Edison lamps like I yep. was showing you. You know, and why are we doing that? Because that has, in my opinion, would have the maximum impact of getting light to people that need it the most. I mean, you and I have the I'm sitting here in a beautiful surroundings. It's, we're enjoying that. There are people who are in inner cities that can't see a green tree if they wanted to. And even if they could see it, they wouldn't feel safe to do it, go out and do it. So why would we set them up? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I ran, you know, we've, we've done, I did a paper with John Louis down at the University of Miami. And John, uh, Professor Louis, uh, John Louis has been, going into black uh, churches over and over again, trying to explain to them the need for sunlight in the black community. And he told me, he said, Scott, we had to have this conversation. And so we put the paper in, it would, you know, didn't do much, but, but the point is, is that, you know, we have to accept that there's certain things. And that's one thing, the beautiful things about optics, it's just the number, you know, there are three to four times higher, there's three to four times higher level of near infrared exposure needed to match this, the stimulation of someone who has light skin compared to someone who has dark skin. Mm-hmm. And so therefore the lighting should not be the same for those things. So what we chose is we chose to try and match what we believe is the right lighting level, not only for the black population, but also especially for children. And that's a three to one ratio that simulates being under shade. Um, that's why we do it. And I think that it's time for us to put on our big boy pants and have a conversation about it because, um, you know, it's important. And, you know, the DOE took none of that into account, none of it. And there were some top people, you know, I went and tried to argue at the first one and then several other really top, what I consider top notch optical guys tried to, to explain it to them again, but they still went ahead with it. And it's it's unfortunate because it uh, essentially, I understand that they think that they're trying to do something good, but they don't understand the problem, and therefore they're creating a bigger problem 
which is somewhat symptomatic of a lot of the green problem, the green initiatives. They don't think it through very well. Yeah, I feel like it's a lot of like superficial facade type um, initiatives that they, they look good uh, like at the face level, but when you actually get down to it, like they could actually be making the problem worse or have a null effect. And I mean, just for an example, I feel like I, I just heard you talk on Max's podcast about how, okay, you have all these energy efficient light bulbs, but now there's like way more of them. So you're actually, or maybe using the same amount of not more energy because there's just more light at night now in general. Yeah. And, you know, it used to be there was a, I would, somebody told me what the effect was, but bottom line is if you make something cheaper, you'll just get more of it. I think it's Ferner's effects. I don't know somebody, but, okay. but it is true. I mean, we have our over lighting so many areas, people don't appreciate the, the, intelligence associated with just turning the switch off and maybe if you really are having struggling with sleep and all that kind of thing maybe you need to sit and read a book because in the old days you ask about and so uh, the older times versus the newer times i mean you think about what happened they're sitting there with an incandescent light that is overkill in some ways because it's like 10 to 1 near infrared divisible ratio but it's sitting there and it's reflecting off of a piece of paper that has high reflectivity in the near infrared and star wave bouncing up into your face. And you read that and then you turned it off and you went to bed in the dark. And I grew up in the Midwest and, you know, you could see X number of barn lights associate one light associated with each one of the farmers. And, you know, you could see the sky. So it's really, that's why I keep on thinking. It's all kind of interconnected. Mm -hmm. standpoint of we're messing around with what we are exposed to and putting our kids at risk in schools because we're lighting in a certain way blocking all the near infrared from coming into the buildings by and you know and then you know then you've got this i guess now i lost my train of thought sorry <laughs> see your moment <laughs> i mean yeah it's the schools the prisons like the nursing homes all yeah. of these institutions yeah, are just yeah. and also all the kids in schools today are also on the chromebooks like they're on laptops all day long too on top of it yeah and you know we it started out with the myopia epidemic yeah and uh you know that's still going on and everybody's kind of waving their hands about it but the reality is is that the solution trying to take some puts them out in the afternoon for an hour to get to try and deal with it a little bit but understanding that is it to me is really fundamental you know to to so many problems we seem to be having you know it's one thing if you have oh myopia but now you've got all these other things mitochondrial diseases here you got autism you got all i'm not saying this is going to fix anything and i would never you know tell anybody that you know i'm going to solve your problem but us understanding if that's what's really going on might lead to some solution. You know, I keep on, you know, uh, my granddaughter's fighting neuroblastoma. I believe that if we had the right amount of research and they won't let us do the research is that you could supplement chemos with light. Absolutely. And at least run the experiment, you know, you know, it to me, that's the most frustrating thing. It's just kind of like we have this really bad habit of everybody jumps on a bandwagon. Well, what they don't notice is all the people that you left behind because you're not important at that point. And it's kind of, I feel like I wait, oh, well, we got to let the circadian guys have their day. Once they get done, then maybe we'll get a chance. And that's why I think this RFK, you know, or processed food or, you know, there's always something else. And for whatever reason, sunlight is just not on everybody it's i think it's because it's so ubiquitous people take it for granted mm -hmm. you know but now in our modern lifestyle we've taken it away and people don't realize it because they got tricked and i use that word honestly tricked because it's easy to fool the eye and generate a spectrum that has just this these few wavelengths in it and you think it's sunlight and it's not, you know, again, the blue sky, that blue sky up there, you, you can lay out here for a hundred years and you'll still 
be seeing a blue sky, you know, in most cases. Um, but you sit there and you put 10 lux supposedly of a little bit of light into your eye at night and it's, everything's all messed up, you know. But I mean, there's a lot of blue at night. There's a lot of violet at night. There's a lot of, you know, it's just where is it? Mm -hmm. It's not going directly into your eye because you're so busy looking at the sunset and uh, the body's picking it up and doing stuff with it. So anyway. Yeah, I, I think it's also kind of crazy. And I think I was talking about this with Martin Morita as well when he's on my podcast. That's that there's no I feel like today we have to basically we get the tech and then we backtrack and we're like, oh, this is bad for us. Instead of doing <laughs> the research up front to show that it's safe, you have to prove that it's bad. Yeah, but, but you know, it, it has been such an amazing, almost humbling journey to go through what I've been going through mm -hmm. because nobody looked at the optics of the body. You'd think of all the things, you know, of all the optical, no, very little data. Wow. And the, what the data was there was all done. They take a laser beam, they take a piece of pig skin, they shine the laser <laughs> beam on it, and they put a detector over here and they say, there is no light penetrating. Wow. And, you know, I say, okay. Do that same setup, take a clear ice cube, shine it through, all the light gets through the detector except for net for now losses. Take and replace that light cube with a chunk, same size, snowball, it's a cube of snow. The whole thing lights up. Intensity level of that detector drops to zero, almost zero. And that's what's going on in the body. The body is this translucent, especially in the near infrared, is this translucent scattering mass with low, very weak absorbers, as Bob Fosbury likes to call it. And that allows the light to vest, scatter and bounce around and equalize, not equalize totally, but it essentially distributes it out to all the mitochondria, all the cells. And then what it does with that seems to be good, you know, seems to be really good. All the red light therapies are, people are getting a result. And, but the reality is that's going on at all the wavelengths, you know, from X to Y. And then you got this skin effect going on at the outer wings where we're making vitamin D. And so there's, and that's all happening simultaneously. It's not happening, you know, if I can, if I'm generating a whole lot more vitamin D because of what I'm doing at these wavelengths, then how does that affect the performance at these other wavelengths? Because it were one body, you know, yeah. we talking to each other, all these cells are going thing. So it's the summation of all those things that end up being the, the, in my opinion, be the, the, uh, what we're, what we can, would call health, you know? Well, that's also what really grinds my gears about the UV light research, where it's like, we take UV light in isolation. We show that it has these effects on cells. Meanwhile, like we'd never encounter UV light in isolation in nature. It's always a very small amount with an abundance of red and infrared. And there's also research showing that red and infrared light can protect the skin from damage and photo aging, et cetera. So it's like, what are, we, what are we doing here? This research isn't actually, it's like disingenuous. Yeah, it really is. And it's, it's, I don't think it's on purpose. It's just, all I say is, is that, you know, most experiments, you run it to a point until you get a result, mm -hmm. you know, I got to get a result. Now I get the result. But did I run, you know, there's people that have shown that near infrared can be damaging the skin. Yeah. If you put a blast for a furnace next to you, you can, you can do something, you know, but if they go to super high levels or something like that. But, but then, then conversely, one of my things about the red light therapy is, is that I'm very concerned that, that uh, there's what we, we as Americans, especially if a little's good, a lot's better. Oh Yeah. <laughs> and you know what people need to realize is is that you know you don't have when you get a bright light or the sun's up there we're used to one sun we can look away from it mm -hmm. if you're in the near infrared in particular or the red you people people are having panels they're they're shining the emitter right into their eyes and and they're high intensity point sources they don't have a glance away response and that to me is really scary um, because, you know, you can do some real damage. There are a lot of old physicists that were looking in ports uh, doing plasma research that lost their eyesight and all that. Or laser, near-infrared laser diodes used to have, uh, used to have uh, all these lockouts to perfect you. Something. Now we're selling, giving the public all these little things. And you're looking directly at the emitters. I'm kind of going, 
going, you can do some real damage. And then that would be detrimental to everybody because then it's like, this is bad. Mm -hmm. There was a time where women were stuck sitting in front of a, a, a fireplace and, and cooking. And they would get red rash on the inside of their leg because they were continually exposed to longer wavelengths at a high enough intensity and temperature to literally cook their legs, mm -hmm. you know? So the right balance, I mean, body's all about balance. It's not about trying to take this extreme, that extreme. It's trying to keep within a range, an amazing range. I mean, you think about the temperature of the body and how well, yeah. Frank, okay, all these different, you know, our insulin levels, all these things are being regulated within very close, close tires. Now, all of a sudden, you take out the largest energy input to the body, which is the sun, 30 megajoules per day, and you're taking it away, and you're putting in something that is entirely different. That's a problem, I think. And that's that's what I uh, my concern is. And, you know, we start out when we try, try and sell somebody a light bulb. I keep on saying we're the worst marketers they are because, I mean, we just, our first comment is go outside, not in not in direct sun. Just go out in the shade, sit there, put a hat on, do whatever, you know, do that first. And you know, if you still one more, that's fine. So you have all because it's just a tool. It's not solving every world hunger or anything like that. It's a tool, and it, it, I think it's a good tool. But that's what what we do. Yeah, yeah, and I'm thinking like also about like the processed foods and and such. Like you were mentioning Kennedy's um, speech, and I feel like in a lot of ways that's one of the gateway drugs into light. Like it's, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like all getting chickens in your backyard. I feel like it's also a gateway <laughs> drug to this this stuff. But it, like if you push it far enough, you realize just how foreign the indoor modern environment is. It starts. You can't unsee it really once you see it. Yeah, I think that's the hard part. It is a hard part once you see that the data. And you're looking at it and you're saying, why doesn't anybody else care about this? You know? Yeah. And and it's hard because uh, there's all the people have to understand the scale of money that went into just circadian and the scale of money that went into generating LEDs. And LEDs aren't bad. They just need to be coupled with something that is more like what you get in nature. Um, in fact, I would argue that the LEDs, because they are so efficient, and they're not as efficient as an incandescent for the particular area you're at, but uh, spectrum of, that you're trying to do. But, you know, LEDs, they're great. I mean, we use LEDs. We put a little incandescent bulb with it. Two spectrums match. You end up with visible and near infrared at a four and a half to one ratio or three to one ratio. And, uh, you know, it's easy to do simple um but unfortunately you know companies have put a lot of money into developing these uh visible only emitters and how do you overcome that because you know it's kind of a hard 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 thing to to say go back to your customer and say you know that incandescent bulb well we just need a little bit of it and you know <laughs> And and it's a, it's so beautiful from the standpoint of the, of the simplicity of the whole thing, because you know, a little filament, short filament, like you used to have in flashlights, um, is a hundred percent efficient at generating a little bit of the red and all the way out to you know five microns or beyond, or at least three or four microns. So it's it's a great thermal emitter, almost a hundred percent efficient. Couple that with a little bit of LED, it's a lousy. The incandescent is a, a lousy blue and green maker. Doesn't do it well. Doesn't do UV. LEDs do. You put the two of them together, you know, literally, <laughs> and uh, you get you get a pretty doggone close match to what you get in natural sunlight. And so why wouldn't we? You know, if there's even a chance that we were right, that there is a problem associated with it, instead of the thousands of papers on red light therapy, which say that there's a, a effect, then why wouldn't you do it? I mean, and the only reason we're not doing it is because some ning somebody at the DOE decided that 120 lumens per watt was something that they wanted to set, force us into and with no science to back it up. I was there. When we got rid of incandescence, there was no research that said, oh, was this a bad idea? There wasn't zero. And the DOE is wrong. 
and they need to and they need to also do the same thing with uh, windows treatments. They're blocking the part. There are studies after studies that somebody's closer to a window, an open window in a hospital gets is gets well better. There, is, I remember one of the glass manufacturers. I was talking to him, talking to him about it, and he said. You know, that's why we saw that. What they've been doing is they've been moving the edge, the reflect the the uh, the the edge of the spectra uh, the mirror that they were out to longer and longer wavelengths, and they were seeing improved health in all cases. What happened? They hit a point where the DOE regulations said you can't move that any further because we have to have solar gain in our buildings. So, so what do we do? We build all these high scapers, skyscrapers uh, with this near infrared blocking, we flex it out. And so those people in there might explain some of the CEO's behavior, but other than that, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're just plain dumber is what the bottom line is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like the more we strive for energy efficiency in like tech and, and home, it's like creating this energy crisis in our biology because we're not realizing that. You know, just because it's efficient for technology doesn't mean that it's not absolutely starving our bodies of this essential nutrient in the form of near infrared light and UV light. Yeah, and that's one of the hard things is how do you explain it to people without going overboard? You know, near infrared starvation, sunlight starvation, you know, processed meats will kill you type. You know, how do you how do you you know, the data is there. People can make their own judgment. And I believe that the data is is enough to to. I mean, buy a stinking light bulb, go outside. Going outside is free, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, that, and that was one of the things with uh, John Luis. There are areas where the tree levels are so low, and it tends to be in the poor neighborhoods, tends to be within the black communities and the Hispanic communities that need more light. Yep. And we're taking it away from them. And none of that's going into any of this uh, social engineering that we're going through. Um, and I find that really frustrating because I think that there's some real positive aspects. And again, it gets into, you know, we're going through now um, internal air quality, mm -hmm. IAQ. Well, what about the optical part of it? non-existent all they're trying to do is filter out some particles I'm not saying it's bad but from my standpoint you know i would argue that you know you'd be better off getting fresh air returns more because there's things that sunlight is generating in the atmosphere on a circadian basis you know it, that are beneficial to controlling um the amount of viruses in the air mm -hmm. and all that I mean, during COVID, I did a lot of work uh, with a gentleman on uh, doing computational fluid dynamics, trying to understand how transfer of disease in short range. So we did a series of models. And what we found was, is that when you're outdoors during the day, around nine or 10 o'clock, uh, Professor He did some studies. He showed that we get this peak in hydrogen peroxide that peaks up about one o'clock, goes back down. Ozone does the same thing on the Earth's surface. And then at night, microbes in the soil are kicking out nitric oxide. Mm. All three of those are at levels that are germicidal levels. Wow. But stay inside. <laughs> let's stay inside. <laughs> let's, 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 not. and so the point being, now you couple that with two facts. One, uh, the epidemiologists have shown that there was about 90 to 99 percent of all infections occurred indoors, mm -hmm. you know, where you've stripped out this reactive oxygen species effect. And uh, number two is, is that and there's my another one of my senior moments where I, I had a thought that I was going to go to. But <laughs> is uh, it vitamin D status? Yeah. Well, no. Was I, also, I, was, the COVID patients were like all depleted, basically. Yeah. All severe ones. Yeah, but uh, but you know the, the point being is is that oh, the, if you look at the the most striking data that I ever saw was the data associated with the black population during COVID. African Americans died at forty times the rate of sub-Saharan Africans. 
who did not have vaccines, did not have all these other benefits that we have. That is That should be right there, should be a reason to fund research and to understanding how can they be that big a number. And unfortunately, politically that, you know, we tried to bring, bring it up with uh, the NA, NIAID and Fauci's group and they, they wouldn't listen to it. And it's really frustrating. Because you know we're gonna have another one of these things one of these days, and okay. they're gonna their only solution is gonna be to shove everybody into a building with everybody else, and that's a bad idea. It's the wrong, yeah, it's the exact wrong idea. And I, I think about this a lot actually, like the disparities in health outcomes of, among like black and brown communities in the states, and how basically most of the U.S. is a pretty northern latitude, so we have less flight quality. That you know their skin actually requires more light, mm -hmm. um, and so I think. Uh, we often focus on the socioeconomic aspects of that conversation, but there's just like this whole other glaring area that needs to be addressed. And I feel like uh, on one hand, I can kind of see why there's a uh, resistance maybe to um, adopting these ideas. Cause I, they, I think they are pretty inconvenient in some ways and disruptive in a lot of ways as well. So I think the pushback is not, entirely unexpected but i do feel like it is building momentum that's been my experience at least i haven't gotten much pushback at all like as i've been putting out messages like this online people seem to be very hungry for the information and it, it seems to be resonating with people as well yeah i mean it in the great scheme of things uh scheme of things the you know you're talking we evolved over millions and millions of years in this one environment and then in a nanosecond from a history standpoint or whatever you want to call it evolutionary standpoint we've done it in complete flip-flop and it is not it is a totally valid statement to say we've gone through the largest reduction in solar exposure in human history period and it is having negative consequences and you know do we understand them all no we don't but all i can say is is that if i look at it optically the body's doing some amazing stuff trying to take advantage of sunlight and if we take it away doesn't mean you die the next day it means that you're operating at a lower level i mean given all the people what people do to work on maintaining their health through exercise clubs and all this other stuff and i'm the last to judge anybody but the point is 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 that you know why would you not do something about the lighting and your exposure to sunlight you know and it's 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 in so many ways it's just common sense i mean agreed you go out go for a walk in the park you know it feels great I, yeah it feels great you know bob fosbury I, I love his little comment he said you know isaac newton didn't discover gravity because an apple fell on the head he was sitting under a shade tree yeah. that, that's <laughs> that's what's going on and it's not that much more complicated than that now are there other things like food and all that but you just look at it from a megajoule standpoint an energy standpoint sunlight blows away all that other stuff now it just does but for whatever reason you know it's not something that we're going to we we think we understand it maybe i guess i don't know but, yeah it's definitely been written off i think as just this background given that's not important for some reason i think just since the grid came out in the late 1800s there's just been an ignorance around the role of light in regulating biology i don't know why that is i think you know we're definitely well, in the renaissance mean, but there's some really great papers out there that what happened is because back in as rogers uh, shows multiple times on his on his uh cast podcast this is that you know florence nightingale was not only a good nurse, she was an amazing statistician. And she used observational to come up with the idea that, hey, put them out in the sun. Hey, get fresh air into them. Hey, give them decent food and they will be better, you know, outcomes. And, you know, it's, and but what happened was is, is that once Rockefeller and others got into the, the pharmaceutical business, they literally put those that that science out of business and that's where i it's almost like what we're trying to do now mm -hmm. you know it's all disinformation it's all you know some 
these are from people who have never had a, a creative idea in their life. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's just, you know, the process of discovery is amazing. But, you know, I have 85 issued patents. I can say this. Most people don't really understand what goes into actually having a truly creative idea. And, you know, I, that's not to put, they've got other things to do. They got more important stuff to worry about. Only certain people that get really nerdy like me that don't care about a specific task go after this stuff. And, but it's really frustrating because they get in the way. They do. <laughs> they, they really, really do. do. I mean, and, and especially, I keep on saying that that uh, the first, you know, you're ignored. Then they try and discredit you. And then it's their idea. You mm -hmm. know, that's just the way it is. But, you know, we're a little company, two people company. We're making light bulbs and we're making them because what we think is the right answer to do it. They're not perfect. Never claim they're. I, I, if I had my druthers, we'd all switch over to DC and do all this other great stuff to save energy. And lighting would just be a component in that situation. Um, I think the other thing that people need to, that, that I was surprised about is, is that when you look at nature and other than a tiger's about ready to eat you or a rock slide's coming down, there's very low frequency modulation. It's a calming environment. You know, leaves wiggle a little bit. And if you look at that from a frequency modulation standpoint, nature tends to do everything one hertz or less. Okay, now people who are exposed, certain people are exposed to 15 hertz. They go into epileptic seizure. Most of your laptops and, and TVs are doing 60 to 240 hertz modulation. So it's high frequency modulation to your EMF issue. How much of EMF is associated with you're getting exposed to high levels? Because the two go together. Yeah. You know, you, you know, we have... LEDs that are sitting there strobing. You have fluorescents that are, they had to get up to 10,000 hertz in order to not have an effect 30 in my day. You know, they did that. They didn't do that because they wanted to. They did that because it was causing negative effects. Right. So you either have to get it way up in frequency to where it's not affecting, or you're being exposed not just to electrical field stimulation, but you're getting exposed to light modulation because the body the uh there was a really great paper of all people professor light hmm? uh <laughs> up in alberta and he took leds and he took some uh white fat cells and he started modulating and he was able to, he, he he was a, uh, an expert on doing what they call it single cell probe or single cell um I forget the exact name of it, but uh, he basically was measuring the cell wall potential on an individual cell. Wow. At the peak of lamp levels. Wow. What he showed is, is that he could take that LED and he could start turning it on and off. And with a kilohertz response response could literally, it was almost instantaneous. Wow. So at the cellular level, ignoring everything else, light, LED light, can modulate the wall cell wall potential clear up into the kilohertz range that doesn't occur in nature there's so, a flicker in nature right there's there's basically very little if any flicker and even if it's there it's not there yeah you know your tv is sitting there exposing you to flashing lights so flash so you can't see it your uh, lighting is flashing if you buy a like a Philips Hue, I think they use a thousand hertz resolu resolution resolution or, or rate to switch between red, green, and blues. So all this high frequency, I would argue to answer your old question about EMF, it could be that it's mainly associated with eye response or with cellular response to flashing that we can't see with our eye. That makes sense. And is that uh strobing or flashing a uh, like an artifact of the AC power grid? Uh, in some ways it is. 
but you know everybody wants to have you know when the first lcd displays came out they were kind of slow and didn't you know you, you get blurring and effects like that so what they do they got faster and faster frequency unfortunately you know they also got bigger and they got brighter and they got higher contrast and that's where i think the real you know everybody wants to buy the big screen it's putting out 2000 nits and it's got a contrast of 10,000 to one or whatever. They're trying to basically render what it looks like to just go outside. <laughs> right. But that, that is a, that is a temporally. I, I don't know a good word to say it. It's, it's, it looks the same. Mm. It ain't the same. And, you know, so much of you can, you can go all the way down to the little wall warts. I mean, we picked a wall wart that we think has lower modulation, but every converter that goes from AC to DC is doing some kind of modulation. You know, they're chopping it or doing something to do the conversion at an efficient level. And so, unfortunately, because we have this AC grid, the easiest thing to do is just convert it, chop it up. And so much of the dimming that's out there in lighting is associated with what they call pulse width modulation. And so when you want to have this great scene, and romantic, whatever, you, you, you're you dimming it down, you're actually increasing the amount of pulsing, percentage of pulsing that you're getting exposed to because it's getting narrower and narrower. Mm. And they can't do anything else about that because they, the way they're doing the, the, um, the control system and the LED is essentially flashing on and off. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I like I say, I just think that that's probably ninety percent of what the EMF issues really are, because you can't get around it. Because you look at it from a, um, a field strength issue, it's hard to make the argument that a little wall art down there is causing me, anything, but it's not hard to make the argument that the display that's being run by it is seeing not only that, but also the all anything that that little wall art was generating in in ripples and things of that nature. Makes yeah, sense. yeah, that does make sense. And it's just there's like such a toxic soup that I feel like the best thing to do is just to spend more time outside if it's possible, because then you kind of just dilute all that out. Um, and you also get you're not only taking away bad stuff, you're also adding in good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like with the, the conversation around sun and the demonization of sun over, the, like let's say, the past century or so, uh, I feel like it's just whenever anything is demonized as only bad, I feel like that's the hugest red flag. Like you need to look at that thing because there's always a, a risk benefit analysis to any behavior. Yeah. And if we look at the risk benefit analysis of sun exposure, we can see that there's these immense benefits that can be had and there may be some risks and you want to not, not fry yourself, like you said earlier, but that doesn't mean no sun like ever, because it's just going to poison you. Yeah. And they're showing studies where, melanoma risk actually goes down for people who are in a regularly in the sun yep. versus people who just occasionally go out and get burned exactly you know? <laughs> but you know so i you know i think i think it's it's a hard hard nut to crack in some ways because people are they want comfort mm -hmm. they want to be able to see a great show and the thrill associated with it it's just that I'm just hoping that if we add enough of the near infrared back into it, that it kind of counterbalances it a little bit, you know, doesn't guarantee you anything. You know, we do four and a half optical watts of near infrared out of our bulb and a one and a half optical watts of visible, you know, put that into a room like big room. You need a lot of them. Put that on your desk lamp next to your computer, shining down, bouncing up into your face. That's a significant amount of near infrared that you don't have now. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly inexpensive to do. You know, if we ever get big enough, it'll be really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, why wouldn't you? I mean, you know, and then, like I say, with this new retrofit kit that we're doing where you can, you know, you can pick out any lamp you want and just screw our bulb in and plug it in. It gives you a DC it gives you two positions where you can have daytime and night because honestly, most of us don't have time to sit there and adjust every, you know, and I find it kind of annoying if they change the lights on me, <laughs> you know, to be quite honest. Totally. But, you know, to, to you, also to your point, one of the things that uh, 
when I was doing this, I, I took some of the original data, the electron spin rate instance data was actually done by the cosmetic industry. And it was really interesting uh, when you started looking at it because what you find optically is, is that the electron spin rays in the state shows that the UV portion of sunlight and the higher energy portion of visible light generate equal amounts of reactive oxygen species in the skin, okay? So the problem is if you want to totally take care of that problem, you know, block it, you have to actually put um, – Put in pigments that will block in the visible, which makes everybody putting on dark face, right, or black face. So you know they can't do that. <laughs> so what did they do? They put in the SPF in basically all makeup now. It blocks the UV, which is the portion of the solar spectrum that actually kicks you up into generating sunburn, erythema. Uh, Sharing sunburn. So mm -hmm. now I can stay out longer in the sun because I'm not going to burn because nothing's telling me it's time to go in. Yet I'm exposed to this other portion. Where does that actually get deposited most of it? Right at the epidural layer where you and the basal cell layers. Well, so you have this regular increase in basal cell carcinoma. And what's even worse is, is that you take and you say to all the manufacturers that we're going to put this sunscreen in all makeup. If you have dark skin, you have about zero chance of getting melanoma, but you have a heck of a problem trying to generate enough vitamin D. Yep. Yep. So what'd they do? They essentially made it even worse for the black population because they're now blocking the, the 285 and the UVA and, you know, other places. And so, you know, you, you can't get around it. You know, it's again, it's kind of like this universal solution is bogus. You it know? is. We are all individuals. We all have different needs. We should be trying to target those needs. And, you know, I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, you run the, just run and look at some of the numbers. It takes like one day a week of sick leave or sickness to offset the entire energy savings associated with converting to 120 lumens per watt. You know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It was poorly thought out. They should have focused instead on focusing on trying to make everything so much more efficient. They should have focused on trying to, get the public to understand how to turn off a light and yeah. how to use it the right way. And, you know, that's, that's the part that's really frustrating because the government should never have been involved in this and they should be out of it. And that's why I would love to see Jay, uh, RFK get in to, to go in and, and do some of this uh, work because I think oh, yeah. he's, he's dead on. He yeah. doesn't know, he, he kind of starting to understand stuff about light, but uh, I think that, uh, it's it's we need some kind of a radical change in government involvement in certain things, you know. Yep, the government definitely doesn't. It's not suited to deal with certain topics. It should be deferring to real experts, not like paid bought and bought and paid for experts that are looking for specific types of outcomes in science or just like motivated to ask certain types of questions. Which is a lot of, I mean, it's a whole can of worms. But the whole government funding of science is just. It's skewing the type of science science that's being done in a major way, which is beyond the scope of this conversation, but equally <laughs> important. I mean, that's the other funny thing about the conversation about light is it really brings everything together. Like all of the issues we're facing societally, I feel like are tied in with this story as well from like the, you know, the addictions to tech and drugs and alcohol and other types of addictions too, how, how it relates to the dopamine system and how light ties in with the dopamine system and makes, makes more compulsive behaviors and like... Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are walking around just like a slave to their compulsions, not realizing that like their environment is shaping that behavior. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I, because you can still walk outdoors, people kind of think that they, they're okay, but they don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a, A, it takes a location, B, it takes 
time. And, you know, they talk about 93% of our time is now under artificial lighting. I would argue that it's even more than that if you look at the total energy input, because most of the time that you have any chance of seeing the lighting is towards the end of the day. Yep. Or, you know, early in the morning in a car that's got a blocking window glass on it, you know, so, it, you know, they're talking about the visible light. They're not talking about the other part that, right. that in my opinion, is more important and being totally overlooked. And that goes back to your point about like our eyes can deceive us too, because we're only focused on what we can see. Yeah. Yeah. And people, you know, that's a, that's, that is a real, and you know, it's amazing how, how I have a, you, 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 you're great, but I mean, so many people, if you talk to someone who has no idea what's going on and you explain just some simple things about, you know, how, what sunlight is, this is what we made it. They get it. It's kind of common sense, you know, and it's, it's sad that that there's so much in the way of letting us correct the problem and at least educate people as to what they can do. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to write a paper now to, to publish on LinkedIn where I'm trying to go through all this, just some recommendations of what you could do, because I think it's a huge burden that we're putting on the, this generation because they're not getting what they need. They're not going out. And and so many parents have called me up, you know, about one of our balls and, you know, oh, he seems calmer and all that. I don't care about that. I said, you know, how have you gotten outside? Because it kind of changes their awareness. Yeah. You know, this is important. And, you know, there's all kinds of food and diets all over the world. And I'm not one to judge anybody on eating it. All right. But all I'm saying is, is that people are surviving and flourishing across a wide range of diets. You know, that is not the most driving, the number one driving force. I'm not saying it's not important. Microplastics, pick all the ones you want. This one is important because it's absolutely, the body depends on getting the entire it assumes on all its processes that it is exposed to the entire solar spectrum during the day. It's exposed to minimal amount of light during the night. And even then, you know, there are the, it's not like we go from light to nothing. We're going, you know, like 10 to the 22 photons per centimeter squared at daylight, at full brightness, 10 to the 17th photons per centimeter squared at dark night or six, 16 or whatever. So it's not like we go to zero. And there are things, you know, my wife and I were lucky enough to have twins. And I believe very strongly that moon and all this moonlight and all that had an effect on how, how things went at, went in that. And it's just, you know, I think that if for whatever reason, sunlight is just easy to, ignore it is it is this has been a great conversation i want to be mindful of your time but i do want to ask you actually because we haven't talked about it yet even in our last chat how you got interested in light to begin with i'm curious about that well um way back when i was mechanical engineer i was working on making uh, avionics and <laughs> of all things they that was right at the time that they were starting to develop night vision oh. goggles and and displays and there were electrical engineers, there were mechanical engineers. This was an optical problem. I said, oh, I'll do it. What's the big deal? And I built my own double grading monochromator with liquid nitrogen cooled detector and all this other stuff. I got really into it. And, you know, the more I got into it, the more I got to understanding various things that are associated with lighting or for displays and then move from displays into lighting. And all that other stuff, but uh, yeah, it was it was. I was a real nerd in a lot of ways. I literally would have to go back to to the back into the office because the liquid nitrogen was going to run out. And if I didn't, and if I didn't do that, keep that that cold right there at night, I had to wait for the power grid uh. to stabilize. Oh, it was it was real nerdy, <laughs> but um, but it it was it was. I found it fascinating, and my wife was uh, very patient. <laughs> And let me have my little thing. But but now, you know, uh, 
it all seems to kind of culminate up into something that I think is really important. And like I say, buy our light bulb. I'm happy to sell you light bulb, but do this other thing too, because that's what's, you know, especially with your children. I had one gentleman, he's, he's a son, five-year-old. Um, he was fighting cancer and doing good. He's doing good now. But um, he said, Scott, you know, I never thought about it, but we had him out side a lot and he was walking around barefoot and all this other stuff and and do you think it could be i said couldn't hurt couldn't hurt yeah yeah and if i could just get the some people to get out of the way i think we could actually show that there's the body has an amazing ability to heal itself as long as we don't get in the way of it and uh not saying don't do chemo. Not, and I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, body's optimized uh, to survive and uh, we should give it its full opportunity to do so. Yeah. I mean, whenever I'm working with clients or myself, most of the time, whenever I've experienced suffering in my life, it was something I was actively doing that I was unconscious about or didn't think anything of it that was harming me. And when I took the thing away, I was like, oh, wow. But I feel like in the case of sun, even though it's supposed to be our norm, we kind of have to add that back in because it's no longer the norm. So it's like we're kind of taking away the indoor environment and just putting ourselves back into the environment that our bodies are suited for. And a lot can change, I would say, when you start doing that. And I feel like relatively quickly, too. So I always thought I was like a night owl mm -hmm. my entire like teen years up through my 20s through grad school. Always felt really burned out, like at the end of the day when I was working in the labs and all the fluorescent lights and everything. I didn't put two and two together at that time, but I was like kind of red pilled on the light story when, when I went back for my postdoc and I was, you know, basically working outdoors every day. And then when I went inside under the lights, I would always wear my like blue blocking glasses and I left the day feeling fresh and chipper and like huge difference. And so that was just like huge for me, like the contrast between grad school versus the postdoc and just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, you can, I automatically found like a difference in my sleep from the moment I started understanding like the more circadian side of the story and just inter interface between light and our biology. And I just within a couple days started just naturally waking up early and going to bed earlier. I just got tired earlier. And so it's something that you can, I, I think everybody can really feel a difference pretty quickly, um, which I think is important too, because a lot of times in medicine and science, it's like, you're just supposed to listen to the published data and do what is supposed to be good. But that's like for an average population, right? It's not necessarily for you, yeah. but for the individual, like try it. And if you feel better, that's a good sign. <laughs> well, I, I find it interesting that uh, most of the responses we get are from women in response to their children. Number one, uh, just calming things of that nature. Um, but over and over again, I kept on men were dumber than a brick on the whole thing, <laughs> you know, it, it just, for whatever reason, but then I got to looking at it and women have a thinner layer of skin. They have a different layer of collagen than men do. Men tend to be thicker skinned and have higher levels of collagen and fat. And so optically they're indifferent. Makes sense. You know, and, Interesting. and like I say, I mean, you know, I, 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 I totally agree with you on the blue blockers from the standpoint of if you're in that kind of blue. If you're in this kind of blue, it doesn't make any sense. Absolutely not. Yeah. You know, and so it's like you say, you know, you find everybody needs to find their own way and find out what really matters. And we're all different. And but until we understand the bed underlying processes, you know, then we're kind of just it's it it ends up being kind of like a marketing game more than anything else. And, yeah. And I didn't want to do that. And that's why, I, you know, a lot of people would say, well, why don't you just ship it all over to China and, and make a bunch of them and all that. And, you know, at some point we'll expand, but I really do believe we need to have a responsibility to figure out what the processes are, you know, not to be altruistic or whatever, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, we only get one shot at this. Might as well do it right, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's also really interesting science. It is. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> it's really, you know, you, you look at it and you, you know, and that's why this latest stuff I've been doing with the periodic structures is just so absolutely fascinating to me optically because I can put light wherever I want. 
And the idea that the body, you know, how little we understand is amazing. You know, literally trying to model what the body builds every day in every cell is almost impossible to us right now. And I've been working with this one gentleman at uh, Rudiger, and uh, he's got some pretty good software that's modeling uh, various dielectric layers. And you can get some amazing effects. You know, all the, most of the bird feathers, some of the flowers, all that are all, they're not absorbing something. They're reflecting something by using nanometer scale type structures. Wow. And when you think about that, you know, and you start looking around, what do you see? You see this periodic structure in the mitochondria that's associated with ATP production. Is Glenn actually absorbing something in to a particular chromophore? Or is he literally just creating an intensity gradient, energy gradient that local that enhances, you know, some of the uh, Gerald Pollack's situation? You know, and we're talking about it takes very little. And you start looking at the diatoms and seawater and things of that nature. And how bacteria will align to certain to light and move in certain directions, you know. And then you look at the mitochondria and you see all these little rod the things that are moving around in real time. It's, you know, we are naive as hell. You know, we don't have a clue. Big time. So... I think that that if I had anything that I wish I could get them to do is to get them to understand that, you know, if you don't really understand something or at least at a minimum, if we're going to do the green, I'm for green, but there's a certain level of extra proof that we need to change from something that nature does. You know, nature's been doing this for millions of years body is optimized for that thing we can show all these different kind of structures and things that the body is doing to take advantage of sunlight taking and eliminating large portions of it and putting people in positions where they can't get sunlight is is should be the opposite of what we think of as green you know yeah so because if you get sick somebody gets sick <laughs> you're wasting a whole lot of energy a whole lot of energy compared to, you know, and, you know, I, I'd like to see us get to Mars or something like that. Well, if you can't get the astronauts to to live longer than the trip, it's not going to happen too well. So if you can convince Elon Musk to come in and, and some fund some research in the area, that would be good. Honestly, maybe not too far off. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But I, yeah, I feel like the burden of proof really needs to be on the governing bodies that are making these decisions to, like, say this is safe. Like we mentioned earlier, like not that what we already had, what nature provided was somehow suboptimal, even though that's what we came up in. And yeah, I mean, I'm really hopeful, though, for for the future. I think things are moving in the right direction and excited to see how things develop uh, over the especially post-election. We'll see what happens. But <laughs> <laughs> I feel hopeful. I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it, the government has a lot of responsibility. I understand that. But uh, they need to. You, you can't just go changing our environment, you know, like that and not have a negative effect. That's the one of truth. Yeah. And so there should be a higher level of scrutiny. And, you know, we're both scientists. We love, we love data. We can get the data. We have all the tools. But as long as they won't get the data as long as they're, you know, essentially shutting groups down like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can get around their thing probably, but it's kind of dumb that I have to, especially where my main goal is to get these things into places where people need it the most. And the best, best way to do that is a little Edison bulb, screw it in, do your thing, sit there with your laptop, I don't care, and go outside. Yep. So. Yep. And the moment we come to terms with this also, we can start developing better tech. Like, I don't know if you know about like daylight computer they're making. I should have brought it with me. I have one at home. It's like a 
it looks like a tablet, but they're going to be making phones and other stuff too that reflects light. It doesn't emit light. And so it doesn't emit any blue light. It has like an amber backlight if you want to use it at night. It renders beautifully. Like it's very crisp and I can use it for social media. I can use it for whatever, emails, whatever else. And it's it's this great tech that is working with our biology instead of against it. And to your point that you made just a moment ago, like the sicker and more low agency people are, like that's the worst case for energy efficiency because, you know, people are just going to be more mindless with their use of, you know, whatever energy, keeping lights on all night or just waste being wasteful in general. Well, and, and how deep does it go? I mean, cortisol leads to high levels of cortisol is followed by a lot of dopamine. Mm -hmm. It's a strong agent in associated with addiction, you know? Yep. Is there a way we can do something that helps that? Um, so many different issues that uh, society's facing, I believe, have at least a part of their associated with the lighting and our lack of sunlight. That's it. So I totally agree. Um, I'm going to link to every like everywhere people can find your bulbs online, and you mentioned that you prefer people buy the DC bulbs, which are available now and your converters are going to be up on the website soon. Yeah. Because I mean, the AC bulb works. It has, we've got a new design coming out that gets the flicker down to about 2% nice. and it makes it, you know, it'll be good. The first one we came out with, I had too much flicker as far as I was concerned, but we took it out there to people to start giving us feedback. And that was one of the feedbacks. And so, uh, no, the new AC bulbs work where we are, if you're if you're plugged into an AC circuit with a regular incandescent, you get eight to ten percent flicker modulation from the 120 hertz. Okay. okay. People have lived with that for centuries, and I don't know that that's terrible. I just wanted to make sure that our bulb didn't do any more than that, and so we did a little bit less. And like I say, it's two percent. It dims better. It, it behaves better. So there's nothing wrong with the AC, and in a lot of ways, it's a simple solution because you can just screw it into a regular outlet if people really care and i actually have uh, one customer uh she's a very nice lady she could tell the difference between ac and dc you know and and i believe her i really do um so the dc is just that it is direct current has no modulation other than a little bit coming off the wall ward but very little at all and the beauty of it is is that you know, if we could ever get ourselves around to moving away from 120 AC and just put in 48 volt DC, we have another product we're working on to make a driver that allows you to dim it all the way from, from uh, you know, full on all the way down to about 100 or 10,000 to 1 to 100,000 to 1 dimming range. Wow. One of the things that people don't realize about LEDs is, is they're, the old incandescent, you could dim them down to where it was just a nice little glow. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with an LED. A lot of them that you buy, oh, I'll dim it down. It goes down, and it typically, a lot of times, it'll shift to blue, even though some of them are now doing the the color change. But but what it does is, is that you, as a person, would have turned it down further if you could. So their energy savings is kind of a farce. And if you look at what happens when people put it outdoors, those bulbs tend to be a kind of cheaper or whatever. You don't see people dimming them down, you know? So in a lot of ways, the supposed gain we were getting in lumens per watt is kind of bogus. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you had the dimming range of your old incandescent, you could have dropped it down and then you could have been saving more energy than their LED dimmed down to the 10% or whatever the number they can get to. So unfortunately, there's a lot of devils in the details. And so one of the things about our DC is, is that we have a work on a design to where we can actually make it to where you can dim all the way 100,001. Because I believe that a lot of the so problems associated with um artificial light at night is is that they can't dim right and if they do dim what do they use they use pwm which means that you're getting all this flicker there was a story about a lady in the dc that uh, the guy came up you know, somebody the light the street light wasn't working right 
And uh, so they came out and she, she came out the door and she said, you fix that. I'm just going to have to shoot it out again. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so many places people are struggling with the fact that these, they talk about, well, I'm going to 3,000. And people, you know, as a scientist, you can relate to that. When somebody tells you 2,000 degrees Kelvin or 3,000 degrees Kelvin, that's a black body. Mm -hmm. It has content all the way out. You know, what the lighting industry did is they truncated those, and now they're calling a correlated color temperature of 3,000 Kelvin because they only provide this little bit of the whole thing. Right. And so, you know, that's the, there's a lot of games that go on in marketing for lighting. And in a lot of ways, the LEDs are not um, as good as an incandescent if you just looked at these other properties. And the, if they were being tr truly honest, it's not really saving as much energy as they propense to, to say. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Our senses deceive us, but I think at least you're providing a really great option. And of course, the amazing guidance and, and insights about why it's important to go outside and doing that when we can. And between the two things, I think you can really make a difference in people's lives. And like I said, I'll link to the products in the show notes so people can find you. But I want to thank you so much for your time. This was really fun. Sorry it took so long. Oh my God, don't apologize. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like having long episodes personally. I like to flesh things out. Yeah. So I think it was great. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Make mitochondria great again. <laughs>